I really mean this, I'll start with it, and if you can hear me, then I'll. Good morning. Welcome to the first of our Remarkable Women program series. Uh, I'm Lois, I coordinate part of the program, and I'm also going to be moderator for the questions and answers. And before we actually start, I have a couple of housekeeping commercials to do. <laughs> the first is a nice one. Your refreshments are over here. Help yourself anytime to the, the liquids and whatever is on the table there. And then to uh, this side over here in the back are handouts that have been brought by Lillian for your reading enjoyment, either here or on your way home or at home. Okay. Um, let's see. I wanted to um, remind you that there's an evaluation that ALA asks you to fill out at, at your leisure. The blue forms are sitting in a basket back there, and if you have a chance, would you take a form, fill it out, and leave it back in the basket under our, uh, the one that's empty right now? <laughs> and uh, say as little or as much as you want, but it'll help us plan our future programs. And this being the first series of this kind, we're really interested in, in how you feel about it. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. The platform set back here, there are two blue chairs you'll see, and kind of some decorations, thanks to Diane, our <coughs> office administrator. Uh, this is going to be used later on for question and answer. It'll be at the end of the program, it'll be however long we need it to be. And uh, I'm going to be the moderator, and I have two prime questions. That gives you time to think of questions you want to ask her. <laughs> and she's going to do her best to answer these extemporaneously, aren't you? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I'd like you to calmly turn to the people on your right, to your left, and back of you, and take a look. And what you're going to see... <laughs> What you're going to see is remarkability among us all in some way. Not always the way Will is going to present herself, but in some way. And what makes for remarkability? Well, there's lots of definitions, but I'm going to use four C's for now. The first one being curiosity. Don't you think you've all come out of curiosity? And I think to be remarkable, you have to have a sense of curiosity. Right. And uh, then right after that is, is the trait of courage. You're curious and you're courageous enough to go seek what it is you're curious about. So you're here, you see, and you're ready to learn something new, to find out something new. And then the third one is a real important one. It has to do with compassion. You know, you have to have something in here that you would like to express, that you need inspiration for, and so you also need creativity. So what, we, what we're doing this morning is we're going to deal with the four C's as it applies to Lil, plus she has much more to offer than that. But I'm sure we're going to go out of here with a little bit more inspiration than when we, when we came in. <laughs> and commitment. And it can go on and on. I didn't know how long you wanted me to be up here. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about my friend Lil. I've known her for over 40 years. We attended Ann Arbor, Michigan School of Public Health together. And um, after graduation, wouldn't you know, we both ended up at the Detroit Visiting Nurse Association, working on the east side of Detroit, a lot of that ghetto area. And Lil here, having a command of languages, was an excellent resource, especially for our multilingual clinics. So we were proud to have her there. But then she felt that she needed to come out to California. She had family here for one thing. And for another, I think she had a calling. She wanted to work with the migrants in Gilroy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how much she's going to talk about that today, but I wanted to remind her of what an inspiration she was to me in her work in the in the migrant fields of, of uh, Gilroy because I soon came out to California and started working at the same health department that she was at, the Santa Clara County. <laughs> so anyway, the other thing I want to tell you is that Lil 
was responsible for inspiring me to do my first marches, holding placards <laughs> and talking about porta potties <laughs> and doing great boycotts and um, going to Cesar Chavez rallies. And um, oh my, it was such a growth spurt for me to get more acquainted with the needs of the Hispanics and, and these issues that have to do with more than economics. They have to do with the heart. So those are the things I wanted to share with you this morning about my knowledge of film. And now I proudly present this fully intro.
would say 50% of our budget goes to education, educational programs, 45% goes to medical missions, water projects, anything to do with health, and 5% goes to disaster relief. So those are the areas in which we work. Now if you get bored, I'll go faster. <laughs> I'll keep you awake. Um, and we started in Honduras because it was the poorest country in Central America. Since then, we are in Mexico, in the Tarahumara, northern Mexico, the state of Chihuahua, um, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, Panama, and Haiti. We're active, very active right now. You know, since the earthquake and the cholera. Um, let's see, I have to go down. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about the beauty of the people. Uh, each country, you would know, each country, the the people are are beautiful in every single country. The only common denominator that I see is the language. Other than that, the people are quite different. Now I can't. Uh, you could do the Cuba. But I can uh, tell you about, like, give you an example. In Honduras, people are very, people are very laid back. In El Salvador, they're go-getters. And um, so they're just different. They're, and, and they all have a beautiful quality about themselves. And here you see some of the pictures. This is early on in Huayquito. Uh, I call it the end of the world. Um, that we used to take um, clothing, di diapers, and different things for the children. And the beauty of the landscape. Uh, of course, it's very agricultural, most of these countries. But I want to point out, what did I do with that thing? The pointer. That uh, pointer that I had. Did I put it down? I don't have any pockets, so I can put it down. Here's your thing. It's a little metallic that I can point. Well, here, I can move. Uh, this is Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras. Um, when you come in to Honduras, I mean, you have to have excellent pilots. And there are two airlines that come in, American and uh, Taka. Taka is the Central American airline. And the people that live there say, that it's take a chance airline. <laughs> <laughs> because, because you don't arrive on time, your luggage doesn't, but at least they have excellent pilots. We've come down between two mountains, so that's dangerous in itself. The landing strip is short, so the pilots have to start their approach at the end of the landing strip and then land correctly. Well, one year we went after this incident, an American um, mission uh, uh, plane went to Honduras and they did not know to, to start early in their descent and they went over the side and just went over into the freeway. So um, make sure that you go with DACA. <laughs> they know what they're doing. I guess I have to go down. These are the early days, and they were fun. So I took another nurse with me the, the first uh, early days that we went, and we did health education. What year was for girls? What year? What year? We were early uh, days. It was probably, we were founded in 1992. It would be 20 years in February. And we probably went in uh, 93, 94, 93 probably, uh, but we didn't take medical teachers uh, then. So we, we took OTCs, over-the-counter drugs, and we also did a lot of referrals and a lot of teaching. And here we are over here, uh, Rosalind, a friend of mine, and myself teaching, and we did um, hygiene, uh, parasite, um, parasites, anti-parasites, um, anatomy, birth control, 
AIDS prevention. I must tell you, in the picture with the children, um, I saw a, a little girl standing on a ledge, and I at looking through a window of a one-room schoolhouse, and I, I couldn't help asking her, why aren't you in school? And I did, I asked her, and she said, oh, because I can't, my parents can't afford the school supplies. They have to, education is free, but they have to provide the school supplies. And they had a large family, and um, so they had to wait until the younger kids went to school. Dental health, this is, this is something that uh, you'll laugh about. Um, I noticed early on that the children really had bad teeth, a lot of cavities. And I worked with the local health department, Alameda County Health Department, and talked to the dentist, and I said, what can I do? And he said, take fluoride rinse, and you can get it in powder. And so I packed all this fluoride rinse, you know, in little plastic bags. And, and I also thought, if it's dental, I should be creative. So on the plane, I thought, well, I'll just, you know, sing a tune. So I, I composed a tune in Spanish um, to, to the um, a song, Oh, McDonald had a farm. What was the other one? The French one. Oh, Frau Jacques? Yeah. But I, I don't remember the lyrics here. But I do remember Oh, McDonald had a farm. So here I have all these kids, and I said, I'm going to teach you a song. En la boca tengo dientes, y ay, y ay, oh, y cada día los cepillo, y ay, y ay, oh, con el meneo aquí, el meneo allá, el meneo allá, en la boca tengo dientes, y ay, y ay, and the next year they knew all these songs, they knew the songs, and I had the teachers do the verses, so um, I, I feel being a, a teacher, because I've done a lot of teaching, I taught at uh, community colleges as well, and um, I feel that you need to get uh, the um, students to pay attention, right? You need, well, you teachers, you need their attention first. And so that's a way of getting their attention. So they got very interested. When I got to the uh, immigration and got to customs, I thought to myself, you yeah, know, this is powder that's in a little plastic. <laughs> So I went, you know, when you travel a lot, you look around and you look at the custom people that look friendly. <laughs> and you stand in that line. So there was a woman and she looked friendly. And she said, what is this? And I said, oh, it's tooth powder. She let me through. <laughs> <laughs> we worked with the School for the Blind in Tegucigalpa for a while. We worked actually, we partnered with a number of organizations. Um, actually, the Lions Club in San Leandro, and they provided funds for AIDS for the blind, and uh, canes, and braille things. And this, this family here, these two children on the right are blind. They're brothers and sisters. And the baby with the mother, and Delmer, uh, is also blind. And the first, now, you know, I'm going to tell a lot of stories, so am I going to have, you're going to have to tell me what well, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Because I have a lot of stories. And um, Delmer, they, they come from a village, remote village, and he's blind. And they've never been to the capital city of Tegucigalpa. Uh, so he approached the car, he felt the hood, and it was warm. He felt the, the, a side view mirror, and it was just um, a revelation for him. And it was wonderful to see the curiosity, to see that uh, in a child. The other thing is, they play soccer. <laughs> Blind kids play soccer. And I thought to myself, how do they do that? Well, they put a little bell on the, on the ball, and they hear the bell, and then it's kick it, you know? So isn't that wonderful? How creative yeah, yeah. they can be. Um, I interviewed solar cookers to rural Honduras. Um, and as you all know, third world countries has a big problem with deforestation. Even Tegucigalpa was the capital, was filled with um, forest and trees and all that, and all that is gone. And just the houses on these hillsides. And I must tell you another story about the houses on the hillsides. Here, the rich.
rich live on hills. They want views, right? By and large, by and large. Unless they have a beautiful house somewhere else. But there, in Central American countries, I don't know about Cuba, but Central American customs, they live in the hillsides, the poor. And so when Hurricane Mitch occurred in 1989, those poor people, because it was around 2 in the morning, were swept down mm -hmm. and died in their beds. Mm -hmm. So there's an advantage of living on, living on the flat. Um, and so are cookers because of the deforestation. And I thought it was a wonderful thing to start. Um, I took, um, you no, know, I guess I went to a um, carpenter and I had him build a solar cooker with my specifications. And uh, I had to do a second presentation because he didn't do it right. So anyway, he finally did it. And um, I had uh, the women. Actually, we had rice. We had rice and beans, and we were going to cook them. And they were supposed to go home and make tortillas, so we could have a feast. So we did. We put both. And you know, with a solar cooker, you can leave it hours, and nothing burns. As a matter of fact, I had a solar cooker, and I put it outside in front of the house, and I baked a cake or something. And the neighbors would come over, and they'd say, it smells good, what is it? And then they were very interested in the solar cooker. So here, uh, what we did then, uh, cook, cook this. I must say, though, the beans didn't cook. <laughs> we just had the rice, and they brought their tortillas, and we had rice and tortillas. Because they were really old beans that some lady had given, them, given us the beans. So that. And this is the solar cookers that we, on the, the on the right here, lower right, are solar cookers that we had built. We took the raw materials and we hired people, gave them employment, to build this. And that's what they used. And you've seen, well, if you haven't seen solar cookers, this is what they look like. And, um, and then, you know, you use the tin foil and then uh, use a glass, and the glass, and then you have to use a black pot to attract the sun. And it will go up to 400 degrees, you know, you can, you can cook that most anything. Now the one in the middle, that's called a villager. And it's called a villager because it can feed a whole village. It has shelves in it. It's huge. It's about, you know, from here to over here. It's huge. And, and um, so they have a shelf and they put their dough in there, cookies or whatever, bread. Um, and that was a... Um, a rotary club that provided that. And we did work, we uh, partnered with our local rotary club in Castro Valley to send a hundred solar cookers. A hundred? A hundred, yeah, we sent 199 maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Naperville, Illinois? Did Naperville, Illinois? Yes, do you know? Was it, you know, I, I thought, well, I thought it was uh, Minnesota. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, they took it. Imagine transporting it and everything. Um, and so here I am teaching, uh, here I am on the left, teaching women to make their own solar cookers. And they're very creative. You know, they pick, up, pick it up right away. Um, now this is a, a literacy program uh, we established as a Maestro in Casa. And in Honduras, it's called Maestro in Casa. In, in Guatemala, on the right, um, they call it a literacy program. In, in Honduras, they have a radio program. And it reaches the seniors, usually it's adults or seniors that live out in remote villages that can't go to school, or have never gone to school. And so they get their instruction by radio. We hired this young woman to go out into the villages and see if they had any problems. And usually they did. And then so she then helped them, and then they completed their forms or whatever they to go on, and they go you know first grade, second grade, third grade. Uh, it's a wonderful program. And here on the right, the, the, this is a literacy lit, literacy program uh, for adults and uh, young teenagers. And we have students that we have sponsored in Guatemala at the university level, and. Uh, I'll tell you more about the students' the scholarships later when we come to that part. But they then on weekends 
help these young these people with their Spanish and learning. So that's how they give back our students by helping others. It's a good program. We also have done eye clinics, two eye clinics. One um, with Costco and San Leandro. Costco provided the optometrist and the optician uh, was also from there. And the second one was with, I don't know if you know about Lions in Sight. Um, and we went with the Lions in Sight, the second one. And our medical clinics. Um, I don't know if I told you, I, did I mention the 50% and the 45%? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did already? Okay. Well, this is the uh, medical place, and when I started, because of my interest in bias in health and, and nursing, uh, we were spending 50% on um, medical clinics and health issues, health um, water projects. But now that I'm interested <laughs> in education, uh, it, it's not that I'm still not interested in, in uh, medical clinics. Um, so it's, it's less, it's 45%. Now, it isn't just going to the place and setting up a clinic. There's a lot of preparation before. And so what we do is, we're pretty organized now. We do is we ask community groups to help us package our meds. And they package our OTCs. We give vitamins, we give um, all the medications that they might need, Tylenol, and get, the, get those from Costco usually. Um, and so they package them for each individual and that really helps the flow of the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, on the left here is our uh, pharmacist who goes with us and she orders the medications and uh, she does the post, um, uh, the post uh, interview. And the many, and these are the people that come to us, and they sometimes get there at five in the morning on wait line. We start at seven, and we go to seven. It's hard work. Uh, this is the individual. Some of the cases that we've seen. These are the dramatic cases. You know, here's a, a child. We saw her. She was eight or nine years old with club feet, and referred her and got her treated. And now she walks. She looks beautiful. This is another, this, this one, uh, it was a medical clinic in Haiti in 08, and um, our pediatrician discovered this little girl, a toddler, with a uh, tritology of the low. Lois can tell you what that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's what they call a hole in the heart yeah. or the blue babies, you know. And in here, um, that's discovered right away. The pediatrician that releases the baby from the hospital already knows, and they get treatment, and they're fine. But here, this child was probably three years old, and uh, and here she is. I don't know if you can see the scar, but she has a scar where she had the surgery, mm -hmm. and that child was um, operated on in uh, Florida, Miami. And the medical clinics, an integral part of our medical clinics is health education. Um, not just, we took at this time uh, a um, diabetic specialist, the one on the right in blue, uh, who works at uh, Kaiser now, and the one on the left in red is a Hispanic speaking dear friend of mine since I've known since the four, four, we were four years of age, uh, and she was doing the 